<clears throat> Good morning, everybody, and thank you to Sikawa for setting it all up and for bringing us together. Um, our special welcome and gratitude is offered to Antati Moss uh, Masheshe that he's on this particular, participating in this particular conversation. Sikawe guide me, is Lulu Krichel here? Not yet. She said she will also join us a little later. A little later. Yes. And Tati Moss, you are very welcome and we look forward. We are um, students sitting at the feet of the teacher this morning, <laughs> ready to learn and ready to participate in what you bring to offer to us. So we just pray blessings upon you as you um, share in um, this particular platform. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sikau. Thank you. Do you think maybe we should uh, as well open in prayer um, and then um, maybe we can ask Robin to lead us in prayer. And Lovely. Yeah, and then we can start. Thank you. All right, shall we pray? Lord God, we thank you that we can meet at this time. We thank you for guest speakers who are willing to share their knowledge and experience with us. And we pray that we may all learn something and be able to take from what we hear, something that will help us in transforming your people, your church, to the good of all. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, Dr. Moss, again, this is the uh, members of the Church Unity Commission, Executive of the Central Committee of the Church Unity Commission that are here. And in the Church Unity Commission last meeting, last Central Committee meeting, we were uh, tasked to engage on the topic of economic justice. Um, a special reference to the unjust inequality that um, seems to mar our, our society. And so, yes, we thank you for your expertise, as was said, um, and as you have been welcomed by Reverend Heidi Peterson, we would love to hear from you. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, let me start by a disclaimer to say I got a call on Sunday from the Bishop saying that uh, I should be here to speak. So you are getting very unfiltered comments from me because uh, I have not had really enough time to, to marshal them properly, but I thought when the Lord uh, instructs you, you don't ask questions, you just uh, obey. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the, bishop uh, the topic is as I, I've received is transforming the economic paradigm, a response to inequality. So to put what I'm going to say in context, I'd like to start by quoting from Aaron Baker in an essay she wrote called What South African, What South Africa, what South Africa Can Teach Us Worldwide uh, As Inequality Grows. Um, the quote it, it goes as follows. For the past several decades, inequality has been on the rise in developed and developing countries alike. But in an age of widening divides between rich and poor, South Africa stands out because of its squandered hope. Mandela Rainbow Nation was supposed to show the world how a new equitable society could be built out of the ashes of repression and racism. But by some measure, inequality in the country today is worse than under apartheid, close quote. The facts are stark. South Africa has the highest 
inequality in the world with a Gini coefficient score that is stubbornly at 65.65, expanded unemployment due to pre-COVID recession, and then further due to COVID is estimated to be hovering around 42%. 7.1 million people are desperately looking for work daily. 2.9 million have simply given up. 1.5 million are expected to lose their jobs at the end of 2020. In addition, the inequality has a distinct racial bias. 89% of job seekers are African and only 2.3 are white. 51% according to the World Bank live below the international poverty line, which is measured as having an income that is less than two, two US dollars a day. For more than two decades since the advent of democracy in South Africa, the issue of redressing inequality has been foremost in terms of policy interventions. From GEAR, ASGIZA, BEE, Triple BEE, the National Development Plan, and et cetera. Despite all these notable initiatives from the democratic government, the lived experience of South Africans has also been one of poor leadership deeply com compromised processes, incorrigible corruption, incompetence, and share wasted opportunities that have created this socioeconomic crisis Africans find themselves steeped in today. It is worth underlying the point that at this early stage of my talk, that inequality is an injustice and any injustice is fundamentally unsustainable. It doesn't matter how long it may take to overcome it. Stark inequality is without question the biggest risk that democratic South Africa faces today. As Ms. Busi Mavuso, the head of business leadership South Africa called it, inequality is our ticking time ball. There is a sense in which it often seems South Africa constantly did us on the verge of a complete conflagration. In an essay titled Poverty and Inequality in South Africa, Critical Reflections, David Francis and Edward Webster reflect on the fact that South Africa is a paradox. On the one hand, as already stated, South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world, with more than 50% of its population living in poverty. Yet on the other hand, it reputably has the most progressive constitution in the world, one that foregrounds expanded socioeconomic rights. In the last Nelson Mandela annual lecture, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in a lecture titled, Tackling Inequality in a Pandemic. He states that COVID-19 was like an X-ray revealing the fragile skeleton of society, exposing fallacies and falsehoods, i.e. that markets can deliver health care for all the delusion that we live in a post-racist world and the myth that we all are in the same boat. According to Deborah Hardon, in an essay, Injustice and Inequality, the pandemic underscores gross inequalities in South Africa and the need to redress them. Without elaborating here, she identifies five areas where pandemic has been particularly impactful. The first is living circumstances. The second is livelihoods. The third is education. 
The fourth is access to internet. And the fifth, fifth is food security. According to David Franz and all, India's seminal paper, policy, politics, policy and inequality in South Africa, they are said that the pandemic without question has deepened inequality in South Africa. The critical question the writers ask though is whether the pandemic and its associated responses offer opportunity for a more egalitarian society in South Africa. They then make the fundamental point that the future is contested. Business for South Africa put the same point differently by saying South Africa is at a fork road. What they both mean by this is that on the one hand, South Africa can follow a trajectory of a possible worsening of unemployment and the deepening of inequality, whereas on the other hand, it can follow a trajectory that makes a turning point towards advances in decommodification of education, of health, of transport, and uses the crisis to image a more egalitarian and successful nation. To return to the nub of the topic, in the context of the economic crisis exacerbated by COVID-19, how do we transform the economic paradigm in a manner that effectively responds to inequality? The debate on this issue is currently ensuing in various fora and social science institutions and solutions are highly contested. I elect to highlight the following four interventions, which I personally regard as a necessary imperative if we are to achieve an economic paradigm shift and a measurable quantum leap in boldly, boldly redressing the question of inequality. None are novel. As I indicated, the debate has been ensuing for some time now. However, for me, it is the boldness that is particularly important at this juncture. The first of my four solutions is na a national social compact. It is increasingly clear that as a country, we desperately need a common vision and a common set of national economic objectives in order to harmonize our energies, focus, and impact in order to decisively reverse the negative trajectory we are currently on. We need what some have called an economic, an economic CODESA, an, a new national economic compact that can ultimately deliver an inclusive and sustainable growth. We face hard trade-offs with limited fiscal capacity and space at this juncture in particular in our country. We need a consensus on what should constitute our immediate, our mid-term and long-term priorities. They can become a national, if you like, economic Marshall plan for the country. Again, Antonio Guterres in the lecture I referred to above also states that in the post-COVID world, governments and social partners have to have what he called a new social contract for a new era. Also in his address on the 21st April, 2022, President Ramaphosa also suggested that an economic strategy will require a social compact amongst all role players. He said we can build on the cooperation that is being forged amongst all social partners during the crisis. David Francis and all identify three conditions that can make such a compact possible due to the crisis brought about by the pandemic. The first is given the precarious fiscal position, all social partners are now open to a discussion not only about expenditure reform 
i.e. social grants, but also about revenue reform, i.e. wealth tax. B, the power of local capital has been significantly impacted by the pandemic. It is now more reliant on government for assistance and therefore more open to concessions. See, some social scientists are forecasting unemployment post pandemic to be as high as 50%. The possible outcome of such a reality is that it will inadvertently create room for civil society voices and marginalized groups into the discussions about the new social compact. For the new social compact to have real meaning, it will have to be completely inclusive. The challenge will obviously be how one draws the large source of South Africa's poor, marginalized, and those in the formal economy into a pacting process. Maybe an expanded network may be a place to start. D, it is vital in as such, in any such arrangement, that those who are asked to moderate their demands, i.e. labor, must also be provided with clear indications of what they will gain through a new redistributive arrangement that aims to benefit the whole of society through policies such as health insurance, improved infrastructure, public transport, housing, and et cetera. Social cohesion. The second intervention is social cohesion. Parallel to growing, to a growing inequality in the last two decades. Uh, we, have, uh, we have on parallel also experienced a growing polarization along racial lines, including pockets of the xenophobic tendencies. Furthermore, the increasing destruction of scarce public as uh, assets, schools, clinics, trains, buses, roads, power lines, and et cetera, at the slightest irritations, speaks to a level of disaffection, especially among the youth, and an absence of patriotism that should worry any right-thinking South African. It is, though, it is as though people don't see themselves in the state or recognize state assets as their own assets. So over and above racial harmony, the RDP of the soul as it was once called in the past may well be urgently needed. This in fact is a space where the church and its institutions have a lot they can offer. In an article, Social Cohesion, Social Justice and the South African Dream, published in the Business Day on the 9th, November, 2020, Daryl Swarapul makes the following compelling observations. Social cohesion and the resulting unity of peoples are important building blocks for long-term prosperity and competitiveness. With cohesive societies being more politically stable and more focused on economic growth and development. A recent report by the Inclusive Society Institute, ICSI, titled Developing a New Economic Blueprint for South Africa, Lessons from Germany. It provides useful insights for South Africa on the relationship between social integration and economic prosperity. Without going into details here, although recommendations for strengthening social cohesion are not easily transferable from one region of the world to another. However, the German experience highlights certain touch points that are instructive for South Africa. Though government recognizes the value of a stronger national social compact in the country's development as discussed above, it appears 
social cohesion has taken a back seat as the leadership grapples with South Africa's ever economic challenge, severe economic challenges. A new blueprint for South Africa's economy should be based on economic growth, social cohesion, and social justice. As a multiracial and multi-ethnic society, South Africans should agree on what unites them to the degree that their diversity is a strength and not an impediment. The third intervention I posit is a, what is become to be called a basic income grant or BIC for short. The pandemic crisis has sharpened this important debate in South Africa. And unfortunately, the debate has tended to be bedeviled by ideological considerations rather than by imperatives of socioeconomic equity and justice. In his paper, From a Two Speech Society to One That Works, to the, to the One That Works for All, amongst his actions plans is an elaborate proposal on, uh, sorry, uh, um, one that works for all. Colin Coleman proposes a 10 point action plan to forge one economy that works for all. Amongst his action plans is an elaborate proposal on the basic income grant as a necessary and urgent imperative. He proposed a fiscal neutral income grant. It is for social stability, including in service of a constitutional obligation that I quote, affirms human dignity, equality and freedom, close quote. Colin makes the point that the role of the basic income grant today must be to tear down the walls of economic exclusion and social indignity. Colin proposes a monthly grant of 1,080 based on the international property measure of a minimum of two US dollars per day as a poverty line. This will be for a, uh, a population of 10.8 million people and will require an additional 140 billion from the national treasury. The most important part of Colin's proposal is that he demonstrates in an elaborate way exactly how this amount can be sourced in a fiscal neutral manner. I will not deal with that much in much detail here. The important point, however, is that he can show that a basic income grant can be realized in South Africa in a fiscally responsible and sustainable manner. The fourth intervention is to accelerate digital access to all, e-learning, e-commerce, e-government. One of the glaring inequalities that was exposed by COVID is a stock digital divide between the rich and the poor. Education was a classic example. Most private schools and urban schools could switch to, to, to technology support learning relatively easily. Whilst most public schools or rural schools could not. This situation will only serve to worsen inequality into the future. Manuel Castells, a sociologist who is concerned with the internet age and inequality, notes in his book, the, the Internet Galaxy, that the fundamental digital divide is not measured by the number of connections and, no, sorry, it's not measured by the number of connections to the internet but by the consequences of both connection and lack of connection. If we seek to arrest inequality into the future, we have to urgently reverse the digital divide. One of the major legacies of the pandemic into the future 
is a forced behavioral change towards accepting the digital platform as a new norm for, co for conducting every day, every aspect of life, from learning, work, entertainment, worship, and et cetera, which will have profound implications for the future. Access or lack thereof to affordable data, digital platforms, and the internet, as Castells points out, will in the immediate future have significant bearing on questions of equity and, in, and inequality. We must urgently expand broadband and digital access through the length and breadth of our country, which will instantly bring information and connectivity access to all South Africans, irrespective of their station in life or geographical remoteness. With e-government, e vital services, i.e. applications for birth certificates, social grants, e-learning, can all be accessed on a tablet or hand device. Technology can therefore be a great economic leveler and in time significantly narrow the inequality divide in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Moss. Uh, thank you for uh, that address, quite informative and um, quite rich as well. And I enjoyed the fact that your uh, interventions that you propose uh, at least cover a wide, a wide spectrum. And um, yeah, they can um, both be activated by government as well as by social um, organizations. I just like the, the fact that you, you used social more so that we can understand that, I hope probably that's what you also mean, so that we can understand that uh, interventions such as these should not only be run by government, but in partnership with um, social organizations. Um, and also if they could come from the social level, rather than just social waiting for, for government to, to foster these interventions. Thank you very much for, for that lovely address. I know that um, you said you will like to uh, be released early um, before 11. So at this time, I will ask if there are any questions from those who heard and if there's any responses to, to your address before we receive our second speaker. Thank you. Just because you will be leaving us soon. Anyone then who has an, a, a question or a response, um, you can indicate and then we will respond to the address that we have received. I see that um, Bishop Charles May did join us. I wish to welcome him, but I'm not sure if he could hear us, if he can hear us, um, especially because it looks like it's frozen his video. Can you hear us, sir? I can, thank you. Oh, okay. No, thank you very much. Are there any responses then? Questions? Was it that clear? <laughs> Just maybe a comment from from me to say, um, in all that you said, um, in what areas would one see that the church can particularly become involved? Um, I know that uh, there have been suggestions that where churches have uh, internet access, maybe they can open up their facilities, especially for, for ch uh, children who need study 
um, assistance and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know how widely that is being used at the moment. So could you amplify? I couldn't hear well. And I think Robin's question was, in what areas could the churches be involved in what you have suggested? And then as a practical example, she also says that uh, she knows that churches with internet um, um, could possibly open their facilities for assistance and um, assisting learners as well in the area of education. But from your side, in what areas could the church be involved? Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment, uh, Roman. The, 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 the no footnote I made in the earlier address was that in my view, the, we, 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 we really live in a troubled society. Um, the, the degree of disaffection amongst young people in particular has deepened over the, the past decade or, or so. Um, we can even say we are somehow dysfunctional as a society. Um, so there's criminality, but our problems are beyond just criminality. Uh, so this issue of social coercion is, in my sense, taking a bit of a backseat because of the more urgent pressures around unemployment, uh, crime, uh, corruption, and so on. And that, um, but in order for us to be able to to deliver on all these other imperatives that can generate growth. As, as the article that I was referring to states, we, we need to find a society that is in harmony with itself. And, and I think that this is a space where the church could lead in, in, this, in, this, in this pursuit, in this endeavor. Uh, uh, and and, and as, as a social partner with, with government and other social partners, we could pay a bit more attention on this issue that there is something fundamentally wrong about a society that wakes up in the morning and somebody just bends a school and thinks it's okay. Uh, because I'm angry, I'm, I'm angry about something, I, I burn a clinic, which my grandmother needs the next day. But you know, when I, I'm, I'm angry, I think it's okay to do so. So I think that we need advocacy from the church. We need uh, programs of youth soul searching uh, in a way that, 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 that uh, allows us perhaps to bring other disciplines, whether it's psychologists and so, and so on. But somebody needs to, to spearhead this intervention. Otherwise, in the, in the scheme of the agent things on various other tables, whether it's government, president, and so on, it will always be in file number 15 somewhere. I just think that it's an area that um, given uh, your, your ability to, 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 to get deep into people's to people in terms of uh, counseling and 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 just uh, discourse, I think this discourse could be a very useful discourse. Uh, and also, as you said, uh, Robin, the the, the 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 issues of access. Um, as I was making the point that this this social compact that we look, we should look at can be based on the narrow social partners as defined in NEDLEC today. And there are a lot of other stakeholders who are marginal in society now, who needs to be part of this conversation if it's going to be deep and it's going to be meaningful. And I think in that, the church again has a lot more access to these constituencies than you know, um, government or labor or other normal social partners or business have access to these constituents. So the, the church could perhaps work out how we, we bring them into the conversation 
uh, so that when the, when this compact when this social compact is the, is is uh, is carved, it, they are they are not excluded by definition. Those are just some 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 thoughts back on that. Thanks thanks, John. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other question while we wait for that. You also referred to decommodifying education and and health um, in your talk. Um, is that really a possibility in the South in South Africa now? And yeah, if it is, how could how could that be? Well, I think the issue is really is your topic says a paradigm shift. Mm. You know, your topic says, how do we how uh, how do we take a step back? Uh, how do we find solutions that um, are out of the box? And and how does this pandemic that is befallen us that has uh, as uh, Butera says, you know, it's an X-ray that has opened up the skeleton of society, which has exposed how deep the, the inequalities are in our society. How do we as a society respond in a way that is sustainable? So, so the, 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 the old uh, interventions uh, that are either state driven or business driven um, um that, that that are profit based uh, uh, as, as as such um, are, are they going to deliver a fundamental difference so i, I think i think the the the, the 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 debate needs to to open up and it may settle somewhere because always a solution is always a compromise mm. but unless one opens this up completely we will not get out of the the, the 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 rail trail the the the, the rail is uh, where we've been before yeah. thank you thank you for that i'm not sure if there's any other questions or comments before we uh, move to our next speaker Just to say, sir, thank you very much, and thank you very much for your time, for your well thought and uh, quite provoking and uh, challenging thoughts that you have given us. I hope we as a church could be inspired to actually lead this thinking out of the box and, and, and put the debate out there. Um, and so thank you indeed very much. And I hope that um, sometime again, when we meet like this, and maybe when we take the conversation a little further, you will again be available to assist us and lead us as we take the conversation further. This is the our first um, kind of like thinking, uh, trying to think and shape our thoughts and shape our response to the inequality that is unjust, as you also correctly referred to. So thank you for your time and thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Well, Bishop Charles? Yeah, saying thank you. You are muted, sir. Thank you. I am not. I was saying thank you, Moss. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we will welcome Lulu Krichel, who is from the from PWC Pricewater House Coopers. And she also has agreed to share with us. Um, and we thank you, Lulu, for availing yourself and also addressing us. As um, Reverend Heidi Peterson said when she welcomed Dr. Mosmashishi, that we 
We are like students waiting to, to learn as we hope to shape our thoughts around this issue of um, economic justice. So thank you. You may address us, Lulu. Thank you so much for the lovely welcome words. And um, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I unfortunately um, only caught the tail end of Mr. Masishi's um, conversation or, or uh, the, the, the presentation that he made to you. But I was just uh, thinking, you know, while he was busy, economists, thankfully, I think are starting to change their minds and business people are starting to change their minds around, um, you know, how we look at the world. Um, some of it, I do believe, is because people believe it's the right thing to do. I think there are some of those that also realize if I want to be around in a couple of years' time, I will have to change the way in which I think things or, you know, approach things as a business as well. Um, I have a couple of slides, but I really want to say to you, I'm, I'm, I actually should have shared it beforehand, uh, but I will send it to Sikowo. Um, I've been speaking to him, so I have his contact details and I will send it on to him uh, to distribute to you. So you don't, you can, you're welcome to make notes, but you don't have to, you know, try and remember some of the figures, et cetera, if, if, um, if you don't have time or, you don't, you know, you don't need to do that. So I do have a couple of slides, unfortunately, as a typical economist, <laughs> so if you will forgive me, um, there are a few things that I want to share with you. Um, I'm just going to go through to the presentation and now I've done something with it. Um, you know, before we all hopefully go back to work, um, <laughs> we have figured out how, how to operate, um, how to operate the, the technology. Here we go. Okay, so I have the right deck here and now I must just share it with you. Um, I think maybe let me start and it was so um actually uh pertinent let me just see uh there we go uh to just you know you should see see my screen now can you see it let me just check okay fantastic. yes we can um fantastic thank you so much so it was so interesting to 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 listen uh, to Master's presentation and the last comments that he made about this is type of society that we live in. There's one of my colleagues, uh, Blair Shepard, that has written a book and you can find it on Amazon. Um, you can download it there. Um, you can also uh, download the audio book if you want. Um, it's called 10 Years to Midnight. And he wrote it actually just before the pandemic. It was published uh, last year in, in July. And it is so interesting to, um, to listen to his interpretation as well. He said he was, he was sitting, he, he travels a lot, or he traveled a lot, nowadays it's less so, and he was sitting in coffee shops and he would overhear conversations between young people um, in a lot of instances saying, but, you know, the, the way that society is structured at the moment and the way that the economy is structured is simply not working for us. It is, um, it is something that we we cannot live with and it's something that that really does not contribute uh, to the way in which we um, you know how we live uh, in any way it's not a positive contributor to to um, to who we are and if we look at our our parents um, it's a different it's a different society in which they lived and it and a different economic structure and or they've been in circumstances where they were able to to actually um, you know, build assets, et cetera. And in South Africa, um, it's even more pronounced than that. You know, um, if we're talking about inequality and poverty, uh, we're one of the worst off in the world. And I will show you some numbers about that later. But globally, we're sitting with the gap between rich and poor becoming, becoming bigger. Um, unemployment is a problem everywhere. Um, very few places as big as it is in South Africa. Um, but it is a problem everywhere. Um, and under COVID now, we've also seen small business failures. Um, we've seen sovereign debt, government debt actually increasing. Um, I will speak about that a little bit later. And it's been a, it's been a challenge for us in, in South Africa as well. Um, you know, we've been talking about growing government debt for some time. 
and the rating agency saying to, to us, but you need to manage that down. So um, that, that growing asymmetry and inequality between people um, and uh, you know, between the rich and the poor, the haves and the haves not is actually becoming more pronounced than it's ever been. Um, secondly, um, he identified what he calls disruption as well. And uh, technology being one of the, the factors that we look at. And then of course, society and people becoming more socially and environmentally conscious. We've spoken about technology and, and, and most touched on it as well. And the irony is that, you know, under COVID, those of us that have access to technology um, have to some extent been able to continue with our jobs. And I count myself very lucky. You know, a lot of us that work in services industries have been able to, to actually continue with our work and to be able to work from home. A lot of other people have seen um, their, their jobs being affected, businesses closing, um, some others, you know, still had to continue um, working under quite difficult circumstances. If you think of the mines and the manufacturers, et cetera. Um, and if you look at schools as well, you know, online, um, online schooling, again, if you look at it, um, the, the haves and the people that have more, um, that have the access are the ones that were able to actually continue with schooling. So it's another way in which we basically entrench that growing gap between rich and poor. Um, the same if you look about, or you look at something um, like delivery of, of, um, of groceries, etc. Okay, yes, there are people living in rural areas as well um, that might not have access to that, but are not necessarily uh, poor. But still, you know you, that the gap between the haves and the have-nots uh, being exacerbated uh, by the lack of access to technology. Then um, the age, the population, um, young population that we're sitting with in in South Africa and in Africa. Um, it's interesting, for the first time in a very long time, a few weeks ago, I spoke to um, uh, an economist from the World Bank that referred to our young population actually as, sorry, I'm getting coffee, I'm being spoiled. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, with our young population actually being a di digital dividend or actually you know, a positive um, for us on the continent, and I was, I was thinking to myself, I really do hope that we can get there. But at this point in time, you know, we're sitting with very high unemployment rates globally. Um, we're sitting with even higher, in even higher unemployment rates on the continent. And if we look at South Africa, we're one of the top three uh, in terms of our unemployment level, uh, levels globally. So with this young population, you know, actually finding jobs for them um, is a challenge. And it's... Um, Hopefully, at one, at one point, when we can tip the scales and, and change the direction, it would be a positive for us. And a lot of the, the developed economies in the rest of the world um, will look at us and say, well, you have a tax base, you have people um, that can work in factories, etc., which we don't have. Uh, but at this point in time, um, we're, seeing, we're seeing the counter of that, actually. And if you're looking at unemployment, about 75% um, of young people are unemployed. So one in four actually has a job, the other three don't. Um, so yeah, a massive challenge for us. Polarization, um, also, I think we kind of missed the boat on this one. I personally missed the boat on it a few years ago to see that, that this is actually happening. Um, when we think about, um, Brexit, when we think about the election of Trump, I suppose a lot of economists, including myself, were looking at it and thought, we can't believe that that would happen. But it again, I think there's one important thing that it shows is that we are out of touch with how people actually feel and the frustrations that they have. And whether you agree um, or not with Brexit or with when Trump was elected and, and the way that he does things, the bottom line is, um, that I think if there's one thing that it very clearly showed us is that we don't understand how people feel. And a lot of the business leaders don't understand and a lot of businesses and economists don't understand and the policymakers don't understand how people feel. So there's that, th th this bigger focus, more significant focus on saying we need to look after ourselves because nobody else is going to do that. 
And ironically, um, with COVID, I suppose there's areas where we really need to work with, with each other globally, but there's also the challenge that we're sitting with, again, if you look at Africa and access to medicine and access to the vaccines, um, you know, the fact that we, we even had to have a debate around, um, around access uh, to the vaccines and what it means for um, intellectual protection, uh, again, just showed me that, um, you know, even in, in, in circumstances like these, and I understand that it is important that firms should have some degree of protection, but, you know, we, we are at a point where we really need to, in my opinion, again, I know there's different views around that, need to give as many people access to the vaccines as cheaply and as quickly as possible. So the fact that we are even debating that um, was, was problematic for me. And then I suppose, lastly, um, if we look at trust, and this is, a, this is a tricky one because people have less trust in institutions. They have less trust in businesses. They have less trust in governments. And, you know, as, as, a, as a church organization, um, we were speaking earlier, or you, were, you were discussing the role that you can play. Um, I think that that is one important area where I think a church organization could actually play, play a very important role because you know, that trust still exists with people and you can be a mouthpiece and actually um, get the messages to business or government where, where um, it's not currently reaching them. Uh, but yeah, this is something that I think a lot of businesses are currently feeling and, and realizing that um, if they don't address the trust relationship that they have um, with, the, with their consumers, with their employees, with the communities where they operate, um, it will cost them in future and whether, whether you know, some of them are making the moves because they, um, they want to, and I, and I do believe that in a lot of South African firms that we are engaging with, that's the case, they believe it's the right thing to do. Um, there are also others that realize that if they want to continue to exist, they have to do things differently. And I must say, um, I'm actually encouraged. Um, I work a lot in that space, you know, actually working with companies and firms to say, but how are you impacting the environment where you operate? If you're a mine, what do you do, um, you know, with that community where you operate? What other economic um, opportunities do you provide? Um, you know, we, we, we're currently busy with a project in the Waterberg where all of the mines that are there actually need water, uh, but the pipelines go past the communities and the communities get upset because, you know, when the mines were actually built there and are being built there, they'll be uh, told that there would be benefits to them and they don't see that. So, you know, we work with firms at this point in time to say to them, what are you doing in those communities where you operate? And I do think that there is, there is a mind shift, there is a big shift from private sector to say that, you know, we can't just continue doing things the way in which we've done. The next slide is very busy, I realize that. <laughs> but, um, and, and you don't have to, to worry too much about the details. I just, um, what we've been doing is actually keeping track of some of the, the economic variables. Um, there's a lot of them, things like GDP, um, you know, wh how, what is happening to economic growth? what is happening to employment, where there's a significant lag at this point in time in, in us getting access to that information. So we are tracking things that are more frequent and are being published more frequently. I think the good news is that you will see that there's a lot of green, um, green being positive. We are comparing with a year ago, the same month. So you will see some very strange numbers. You know, last year in April, when we were in hard lockdown, um, most, almost all restaurants and, and coffee shops and so on was closed. So you would see some very strange numbers there of increases of 3,000% in activity. Uh, but the bottom line is there are some good news that's coming through. Um, there are some improvements in the economy. And as I explained it to somebody else the other day, you know, we've, we, we've gone down the hill we, we were at the bottom. We're now starting to climb out on the other side. We are very far away from the top. That I realize. But at least I do believe that we are, have, are over the worst of it. And things should start improving from here onwards. Um, 
So I think that is the key message that I actually want to leave with this slide with you. Um, and, and then I think the other thing is if we look at government revenues, which we will speak about soon, and there's some good news there, uh, which we are getting quite excited about in terms of what government might be able to do and also how government might be able to address you know, our debt issues in the, in the country as well. Um, but here's, here's the, the kicker. If you do look at who has been impacted and where the impact has been felt um, more significantly, it is the lower parts um, in terms of income of the population. And also if you look at job losses, um, you know, it's your semi-skilled workers, unskilled workers, uh, where we've seen disproportionately there's been an impact. Everybody's been impacted by COVID, but disproportionately so if you do look at the, at, um, at the lower income level. So what is going on on this graph? Because I know that for somebody, um, you know, that's not an economist, even for me as an economist, graph, graphs confuse me. What I just wanted to show you, so this is basically, this is last year, um, up until December. Uh, the, the, the number of employed people in the South African economy. And the situation, sorry, has improved. So this is where we were in December, but it's still significantly worse um, if you look at where we were historically. So at the end of 2019, uh, beginning of 2020, uh, we had about 16 and a half million people that were employed. And we're not even talking about the poor employed. This is just people that have jobs. So that's another uh, challenge that we need to look at. If we now go back, you know, right at the beginning of the lockdown, it basically pushed us back in terms of the number of people employed up to where we were in 2011. And we've seen massive population growth since then. We've seen about half a million people coming into the job market every year every year. So it just gives you a sense. And I think that is just what I wanted to show you with this graph is to say that, yes, things are improving, but we still basically in terms of the number of people employed uh, back when we were in 2015. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. Um, and yeah, in, during that whole period, um, there's been half a million people that joined the ranks of um, the people that needed a job every year. So we've had significant losses. And I think at the end of the year, it was about 1.5 million jobs less than what we had at the end of 2019. And as you would all, as you would all know, at the end of 2019, we had significant unemployment issues in South Africa. Okay. This graph, and again, don't be, uh, don't, um, you know, don't actually worry too much about the numbers. The, the big thing that I wanted to show you here is if you look at where the job losses actually happened, unskilled, semi-skilled people uh, by far impacted um, more negatively. Yes, the skilled population um, is, a, is a smaller percentage of the population, but you know, the skilled jobs down 5%, semi-skilled and unskilled down 10%. So much more severe impact on, on the parts of the population where it is much more difficult to find the job. If you're skilled, um, I'm not going to say that um, it's easy to find a job, but it's really significantly easier than for um, the part of the population that is semi-skilled and unskilled. Um, this also, this is from, from SARS, from the Revenue Services. For me, um, I think worrying if you look at this category, and this is registered taxpayers, people sitting in the category zero to 80,000 K per annum, um, and how that number has grown. Um, you know, with I think personally what has happened, there's a lot of people that was moving into the middle class and now has moved back um, into, into the poorer parts of the, of the population when they actually experienced uh, these job losses. If you look at the top, um, we would have liked to see that growing faster because it means that our tax base is getting bigger, but the impact there is significantly less. Again, I think what this just shows is the number of people that moved uh, back into, into the zero income category of zero to 80,000 um, per annum 
uh, from, from other categories. And, and that, I suppose, for me, again, the biggest concern. Um, so I want to go through this, also not bore you with the numbers, but show you what the implications are of what we are sitting with if we don't change the direction and how we do things. So what I have here is, um, is what, what we think um, and what has happened and what we think could happen to the unemployment and the employment outlook in the country. So as I mentioned, we ended off the year with about 1.4 million less jobs than what we had in 2019. That doesn't speak to the unemployment rate. That is just the physical number of jobs. So that number of jobs need to grow dramatically, drastically by at least 500,000 a year to actually allow, allow for new entrants into the labor market. So now we've lost that 1.4 million jobs. We need to grow them back plus some more. And this is where the, the graph that you see here at the bottom actually comes in. So if we if we are if we grow the economy around one and a half percent, where we've kind of been stuck before COVID or even lower than that, we will see unemployment actually continuing to, to rise. We currently at around 32%. We can look at 38, 40% if we don't do um, something about our, our growth in the economy. And yes, GDP growth is not the only thing, but it's an important factor um, to actually address joblessness. Um, if we look at the baseline scenario, so that's where we think we are most likely going to grow at at the moment, given what we know, we stuck where we are. And again, it's not a situation where we, where we want to be. Um, in the upside, if we are able to improve things, we are able to actually address our unemployment, but too slowly, um, because we we want to get it to at around 10, 15 percent. And, you know, if you're talking back to about 28 percent or 30 percent in 10 years time, that's not going to be sufficient. So we've been, we've been communicating this to both private sector and government to say guys we need to change the way in which we think uh, which we are doing things this is simply not sustainable um on the next graph um i just wanted to show you this is uh, again government debt so this is a bit of good news um this is where we were before covid so this line where we were saying that overall debt to GDP was going to reach around 71%. Then COVID happened. And um, this was actually what was projected um, last year in October. But the good news is that our tax collections have actually been more. Um, so government then said in, in, um, in February during the budget speech, uh, the Minister of Finance, said, well, it could look a little bit better. So it's that line, it's lower. And the same goes for, um, for our deficit. So we expect the deficit to be around 7.5%. Um, and in fact, it was expected to be significantly more. So on the good news side is government has a little bit more money, but it's not enough by a long stretch. Um, and that has at least meant that they were able to extend that basic income grant or the basic grant, uh, the grant that they gave to people now under COVID or the COVID grant um, by, you know, until March next year, but, um, that 350 uh, Rand grant. So they were able to extend that. And that's the good news without actually um, negatively impact um, the fact that we need to actually bring down our debt levels. We cannot continue. Um, from a government side to, to continue to grow debt. It's unsustainable and it's going to put us in a worse position at the end of the day. But the good news is that there is a bit more money. Um, so at least, you know, by providing the grants, et cetera, um, they don't necessarily have to take away from one place and then give to another. Um, they have a bit more room to move. Uh, I just quickly wanted to also show you this graph. This is if you look at GDP growth. Uh, for me, you know, we hear um, numbers being um, thrown around about 4% growth and 5% growth. And currently we're around 2.5% uh, growth. That's what we're expecting for this year and then tapering off to around 2%. But the important thing is that sounds really good. What does that mean in terms of, you know, where the economy is? And the fact of the matter is we estimated that with that 2.5% growth that we are looking at now, 
It will take another three and a half years for us to finish climbing that hill and to get back to where we were pre-COVID, you know, at the end of 2019. And we all know that wasn't an ideal situation. We didn't suddenly get into a mess now during COVID. We had high unemployment and all of those things already. So um, I think when we look at these growth numbers, just keep that in mind that we're talking three and a half years basically for us to get back to where we were. I'm not going to go into detail here because it's just going to upset you all, I suppose, if you see what, what ESCOM's contribution is, um, you know, in, in, in uh, our economic crisis. But this is basically just how it's made up, um, you know, and we, how we got to those numbers. Um, what I also just wanted to touch on is, um, is our, our social mobility, and I'm almost done, um, you know, as as South Africa, that inequality. So there's the poverty, there's the inequality, and, and, and there's the ability of people actually to, to move from a position of poverty into a better position. And this graph is very telling for me. We spoke about healthcare, we spoke about education and the importance of that actually being you know, available to people and how important it is to improving their situation. So we are viewed as South Africa, as an upper middle income country. Um, so I think very often when people hear that upper, they have, you know, uh, but yeah, um, we are viewed, if you look at our GDP as, a, as an upper middle income country, that's our peers, that's the people that we need to compare ourselves with. And if you look at how they rank, um, that's the triangles that you see there in terms of, you know, how people's healthcare position is, how their education position is, um, and how that actually provides a, fun, a, you know, a, a foundation for them to move out of poverty. We're not doing, we're not doing very well at all. Um, you know, this is where we're sitting in terms of health, 78th globally. Um, we score a 48th, that's where our peers, that's the average where, where they sit. Education, um, even worse. There you see the best ranks. I'm not gonna go into them, but education, even worse, 80th. This is where our peers are. Uh, technology, we're doing okay-ish, but still not great. In terms of work, and especially if you look at the legislation that we have in place, that's kind of the only place where, um, where we're doing fairly well. But where it really, um, you know, and then in terms of institutions as well, but where it, where it boils down to people's everyday living situation, in most areas, um, we are scoring well below where the rest of our peers are. And these are the fundamentals that people actually can use to move themselves out of poverty. This for me was also really, really shocking. So this is the number of generations that it will take for those in low income families to get to the mean income in the country. Not years, generations. So nine generations, if you're in South Africa, to actually get to, to the average income in the country. And again, I think it just shows that, um, that how that gap um, and that inequality is, it, it's simply not sustainable. We, we saw it boiling over over the last couple of weeks. And, you know, again, it doesn't matter who you believe is behind that. But the bottom line is that, you know, there was the dry wood um, and, and angry population. And there was a fire that was able to ignite that. So next time it might be a different fire. And again, I think, you know, it, it really doesn't, um, it's not something that we in any way should, should say that it's um, understandable. It's not because it, it destroys um, employment opportunities, et cetera. But I suppose one should say that um, we should understand where it's coming from, um, you know, and, the, and people's frustration is coming from and it's boiling over. Um, this last graph, um, it's, a, it's a bit of an economic view of the world, and it's not as simple, um, I suppose. But for me, the big thing is, and, and it speaks to the involvement of other institutions over and above government, private sector, churches, etc., that actually need to step in and say, we, we recognize that you won't be able to do everything. Um, as I said, the good news is that the tax collections are a little bit above where we anticipated it to be. I hope it will continue, but it seems to be uh, driven a lot by 
mining exports and the commodity prices. So let me just show you um, what, what does this graph mean? And again, the numbers, um, not that relevant, but the bottom line is we currently, if everything goes well, we can grow the economy by around one and a half percent. That's not, that's not what we want. It's not sustainable. And it's actually slightly lower than our population growth rate. So it means on an average, if you take GDP as a measure, we're getting poorer. Uh, not to even say anything about health and education, but just, just GDP as a measure, we're getting poorer. And we have been for the past six or seven years, actually. We need to grow the economy at around four and a half percent. That's where we want to be. So if we want to get there in about 10 years time, what are the big levers that we need to pull? And again, as I said, I realize that this is an oversimplification, but this is the important thing for me. And I suppose this is um, when we have discussions with government, we say to them and private sector, this is the things that we need to address. So the first thing that we need to sort out is our electricity crisis. Um, and actually, you know, I'm not talking ESCOM here, I'm talking any way that we, we can get involved and get private sector involved and businesses involved in actually investing in education. That is, that is key. The other thing, um, the, the next most important thing, and you might say to yourself, it's probably more difficult for you to get involved here, but I think where you can play a role is in, on the skill side. And we touched already on it. Um, how do we improve the skills of people in South Africa? How do we give them more access? How do we make sure that that gap between rich and poor doesn't become bigger because of access to technology for one? Um, so that's, that's the second most important thing is, is addressing the skills. And then thirdly, sorry, is to get private sector um, investment going. So this is, a, what, as I said, a bit of a one-sided view, just, um, you know, if we look at GDP, uh, but the bottom line is the message that we take into private sector, and I can tell you that as economists, is to say to them that capitalism, the way that you've been doing it, is not, has not worked. People are fed up with that. Um, and if you don't change the way in which you do things, um, it's going to have serious implications. So um, I, th I suppose the positive news that I can say is that I do believe that that part of or, or business is changing their views as well. I'm going to stop there. Um, yeah, and then we can have a bit of a discussion. And I can also happy to answer any questions that you might have. Let me see if I can get this, this back. Um, and now I can't see you. I've dragged the screen down. <laughs> so let me see if I can. You need to stop share, Lulu. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, Okay, um, I have a problem, it seems. I'm just going to quickly log out and log. Okay. Okay. Here we go. I think I should be back now. Here we yep. go. Thank you. That's better. <laughs> Thank you, Lulu, for painting the picture for us um, and uh, thank you that we, you, you could um, at least in painting the picture try and to make it as simple as possible um, so that we could we could understand those graphs I should say they seem to be a bit challenging just when you look at them in trying to interpret them but I hope we we got the picture of what of what you were saying. Um, we open for any responses and the questions as well. I just want to say I I don't like Ross myself, but yeah, I suppose I have to given that I need to work with him. <laughs> so, but yeah, any comments, questions, um, any any of the numbers that that you would want me to. Dig deeper in, um, yeah. Can I can I begin? Yes, you may, sir. Just first of all, thank you very much for both presentations. Um, you are going to let us have that, that presentation. Thank you. 
Um, just the one thing, and uh, this might be a separate conversation that we might need to have after the presentations that we've had to do. If the church is going to contextualize itself properly, we are going to have to rethink our formulation as church. I don't think that it can be business as usual. Um, you know, we've to let me give you a simple illustration, just in terms of one response to what's been given to us today. Uh, for a long time, the church was very, very much in the foreground of education. Um, we really need to, for a while, reclaim that space. Um, on two levels. First of all, we need to begin to start opening up our facilities to become places of empowerment, skills development. And when I speak of skills development, I'm talking uh, from entrepreneurial skills to marketing skills, to computer skills, to technology, all that sort of stuff. There, is, there are very few institutions that have access to the kind of expertise that the church does. And a new imagination in terms of what education means. And that's got to start in our training colleges. It's got to start with our preachers um, and, and deacons and the rest. It can't just be, now I'm going to be rude, babbling the word of God on Sunday and not finding a way in, in, in fact in which you try and connect to the fact that in that congregation you might have 30 people who have not eaten for a week properly. Um, it, you know, when, you, when the figures of 20 million people going to bed hungry at night we can't imagine that it's got nothing to do with us. The one, the one miracle that is in all four of the Gospels is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, that's not just by mistake. And so, so that's what I wanted to say. We need, you talk about shifting an economic paradigm, we need to shift our understanding of how we do church. Um, I think it's a, it's a spectacularly exciting challenge, but it's going to take every fiber of our thinking to get going on that. Let me stop there. Mm, I can't agree more. I, yeah, um, coming from the Eastern Cape and knowing the footprint of the church in the Eastern Cape, not only just in education, but in agricultural development as well, in how people relate to the land. I think I agree with you, so we need to reclaim that. Um, just a question from my side, Lily. How is business nowadays viewing partnership with um, social organizations and um, faith-based organizations like us? Do they see us as um, worthy partners or do you still as business want to just what's the current view that's a very that's a very relevant question so i think there's two there's two approaches that we're seeing actually it's a combined approach so on the one hand what what i find really encouraging is that business is saying the way in which we do things business is usual should be different. Um, you know, when we should use what we have to our disposal and the way in which we make money to actually benefit the community. So that um, that I think is a bit of a shift from, you know, the, the previous thinking where people tended to have a couple of CSI projects and, you know, off we go and, and that's what we do. Or sometimes they they even they don't even get involved. They just hand over the money and they walk away, you know, and, and they don't actually provide the skills, et cetera. So for me, I think that's a very, very big and important shift that we're seeing. It's not everybody's not there yet, 
But I think a, 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 quite a few of the large corporates in South Africa are thinking differently that way. Um, if I think about, and I'm going to be, I'm going to use their name. Um, we do a lot of work for Vodacom, and what, and, and it's been for the last three or four years. Actually, it's longer now that I think about it. Five years, and I've seen a complete shift where they, where in the past they said, well, you know, this is what we're doing through the Vodacom Foundation. And, you know, they're really thinking about how do we use telecommunication, etc., to make. Um, things like education more accessible, healthcare more accessible, etc. So those conversations are happening. It's happening too slow still, I think, for a lot of people, but it's happening. So that that is that is a positive for me. On the other hand, um, you know, in terms of working with organisations in communities, um, again, I think it's slow, but some of the bigger guys are changing their perspective. Where in the past they would say, "Here's the money." you know, do your thing, um, they now realize that they need to con connect to the that a lot of the challenges that they're sitting with is because they don't understand the communities and they don't, um, you know, and, and, and one of the key, key things, in, in my opinion, where I think churches can play a role is exactly that. You understand the community, you understand what's happening to people, why people feel a certain way, etc. So a lot of the big corporates out there are realizing that we need to connect to, to the community. So I think there's a, there's a unique opportunity to say that we can work together a lot more, um, you know, on a, on a community level and in the communities. And if I think about the minds, I think they're changing their minds slowly but surely. Um, again, if I think about, you know, and it's there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they are are doing things, um, you know, 100% correct. But I think the conversations are happening and it's changing. And they realize that we are in a community. We operate in this community. We work with these people or, you know, they live close to where we operate. So if we don't work with them, it's going to be problematic for us. So... Um, a long way still to go, but I think that the, 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 the views are changing um, and, and the scope um, for, for corporates and private sector to work together with, with community organizations, with faith-based organizations, with church communities and stuff, a lot more. And they do realize that. Um, we just need to, I suppose, help them a little bit <laughs> over, over the hump, but Personally, I do think there's been a, a change in the last, I will say, year, uh, year and a bit. Yeah. Uh, Can I tag on to what has been said there, perhaps? Yes. Calvin. Hey. Yes, Calvin. Uh, just to say that uh, on a constant basis that one do receive these uh, calls where companies want to sell things to you. And I think we need to be more vigilant as well as the broader community that when a company sell, um, wants to come and monitor my home, for instance, a security company, is that we actually need to ask that security company, what are you doing in my community? How do my community benefit from you? And I think it is time that we ask these tough questions before I do business with you. What is it that you plow back into the community so that we hold that company also responsible for uh, not only taking money out of our community and plowing nothing back into the community. And I think it is time that companies also make that shift. The sooner the better, because that is one of the first questions I ask. If you want to sell me something, I ask, so what are you doing in our community? And I think that's that's where we uh, one of the tough things that we need companies need to begin to understand that, and that's my first comment. The second comment that I would like to make is the issue about intellectual property around uh, the uh, the jabs that we get, and uh, we are happy that our president did announce that there is going to be such a uh, company that will make the jab in South Africa. To, uh, to spread and uh, to distribute this jab right across the Sadek regions and so on. But I think that my question is, how will that company be constituted? Who is going to, uh, who's going to be the shareholders of that company? Will I be a shareholder of that company? 
how will it constitute so that if you want to produce wealth and you want to want to really the black masses that doesn't have money in their hand neither in their pocket or in their home there's not even food in the fridge how do you get that guy to get into this company or that person or that family so that we that generation of nine generations which is shocking that nine generations can shrink of course and so those are the tough questions that we need to ask us of, of course and then the issue of trust the issue of trusting uh, and uh, uh, i think that it is important that uh, companies begin to realize that uh, if they want to make business in our communities they need to establish some trust between the community and the company itself because if that trust relationship is not there it's going to be very difficult to enter that community space of course and that's something that we need to begin to work at uh, because we are in this boat and we if we want to uh, um, work in the economy of our country which is in a putrid state of course then uh, then i think that uh, that's uh, that we need to begin to think different and i like the the uh, the idea of beginning to think different about capitalism because i think that is an issue that we really really need to think about uh, and and Thank you, Mr. Jay. Thank you, thank you, Calvin. You want to respond there, Lulu, first? No, I just want to say it's absolutely right. I think what we're seeing, um, what we're seeing is in AGMs, shareholders are asking tough questions, but as consumers, we need to start asking uh, tough questions as well. You know, and and if, even if you're not a consumer in your community, as you say, that's the one space where we can say listen but you know what are you doing here how are you contributing and quite frankly that is exactly what we are saying to to um, everybody that we engage with is expect more of that and be ready for that and um, you know people are fed up with what we what we call rainbow washing um, in the SDGs the uh, sustainable development goals which I think a lot of you might know of um, you know, we've seen a lot of firms putting out integrated reports and we call it rainbow washing because they, you know, those SDGs have all the different colors of the rainbow and then they just say, oh, we do this, we do that, we do that. And we just say that's not enough. You need to actually be transparent about what you're doing, how you're measuring it, um, how you are interacting with communities, etc. cetera. And, and, you know, asking those questions is the only way that we can move um, uh, well, not the only way, it's one of the ways in which we can move people's thinking and, and help them and get to a point where they realize we're going to start to vote with our feet and go somewhere else if we don't get the answers from you um, that, you know, how you're contributing. Yes, I think we all understand that, you know, it can't, you know, with everything can't happen overnight, but um, but the bottom line is we need to have, hold um, private sector accountable. I work for a private sector firm as well, but yeah. Um, we we need to be held accountable. Yeah. Um, again, Lulu, just uh, um, I hope one of I hope one of the things that maybe you can take from our side is that access between business and particularly we are a faith based organization and faith based organization and from where you sitting, um, <laughs> hopefully there could be an an enabling of that communication between private business and FBOs. Um, uh, hopefully we can hin hang, hinge on you and say, hey, um, we are willing to, to um, uh, as, a, as one of the examples, we are willing to instill trust. We are willing to work on that particular aspect. And so we can't do it by ourselves, but we also want um, business to understand that we are there and as um, Reverend Verain Paul has said uh, we're not just babbling in the Bible here but we're building a, a people we're building a nation um, and in our terms we're building a just nation and the kingdom of God so maybe that access you know um, so that it can be strengthened 
and the conversations can also be a little bit faster than slower. So people mm -hmm. like you to kind of like open that access between FBO and business. And then the second... Where I can get involved, I would be happy to. <laughs> yeah. Then the second question uh, from my side, if capitalism is to be reversed, is there an, um, another economic philosophical notion? Is there another notion that, uh, that is being looked at that has been developed or, or are we looking at the traditional ones like um, communism, for an example, mm -hmm. or are we trying, or is, is, is it a question of trying to change the face of capitalism, reform it? Um, so if it is to be reversed, it is reversed to what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very, um... A very good question. I don't think um, you know. I can say with certainty that you know this is we've come up with this new model. Um, I think what we do understand, or what, this is my view. This is my view, and I, I know a lot of my colleagues, and you know, at PwC, that's also our view. Um, is to say that we understand that. We need economic growth. We understand that we need entrepreneurship. We we understand that, you know, you need to actually um, recognize the work that people put in, and you know, if they take a risk as an entrepreneur, etc., they need to get something back from that. So, I want to say that um, the model that I think at this point, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's, it's going to work, but I suppose what we need to figure out is the form of capitalism that we had, you know, where, you know, the rich became richer, the poor became poorer, the gap became larger, um, you know, we didn't involve communities, it was all about profit, etc. And, and um, it's actually interesting, um, as economists, we hated um, economic history, not me personally, I actually for some weird reason I loved it, but I think we spend way too little time actually understanding why certain things didn't work and then you get people in policy uh, positions making decisions that they don't understand why certain things didn't work or where we've made certain decisions, but I was actually shocked to see that you know in the in the mid 80s um, that you know one of the key thinkers of economic thinkers at that point in time said well you know, it's all about profit. It should only be about profit and that way we will solve all the other problems and, you know, it will happen naturally. And it's clearly not worked. You know, I think if we look at every single society in the one in which we are in, it has showed us that it has not worked. So I'm going to say, I, I don't want to give a name to it, but if I have to, I want to say responsible capitalism, you know, where there's still space for, for businesses to, you know, in my opinion, they should make money, um, they should employ people, those things should also happen, but it should happen within a context of um, the community, the society in which we operate, um, with, you know, realizing that there's a responsibility towards that community and society, and if you don't do that, quite frankly, you're going to be pushed out and that is um it might not happen today it might not happen tomorrow but over time um those will be the businesses that in my opinion will not will not exist anymore if you're not willing to actually um you know build that trust relationship be involved in the communities realize that you you need to you need to put back and it, it's i suppose it sounds it it all sounds Sounds great, but I think the, the good thing is that businesses are being held responsible, at least by their shareholders, to say that, wait a minute, um, you know, one of the big banks banks at, at the AGM, um, there was a lot of questions. Was I think it was in total about two hours. One hour, 45 minutes was around what we say ESG, environmental social governance impacts. Um, so why are you in this particular community? Why are you investing here if people are being exploited? Should you be doing that? So um, those are the questions that, that we need to, to ask. And I, and I want to say, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to call it responsible capitalism. Um, I think that's what a lot of people that are referring to at this point in time, what exactly that looks like. 
I suppose we, we're still figuring it out, uh, but it does not look the way that it has been the last 40 years. It can't. Thank you, thank you for that. I'm not sure if there's any other question or comment. I just want to say there are a few a few guys that's still hanging around with a with a. <laughs> sorry, I don't mean it disrespectful, you know, with the with the traditional views of capitalism, and I think it is it is up to us um, actually to challenge that and to say it doesn't work. And I think there's enough ground. You know, to say, even, even if you want to take it from a numbers perspective, to say that this does not work, there's enough information, facts to show you that this, this does not work long term. And yeah, I think we, we just yeah, uh, need to keep on challenging that notion as well. Maybe we could also help you to define it. Eh? Absolutely. Find the best possible, poli Absolutely. Best possible policy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other comment or question. Um, and the question from my side to us is, um, where do we then take this? Um, what then do we do about these um, conversations? Can I make a suggestion, Scal? Yes, sir. Um, we've had two very good presentations. We need a bit of time to have a look at the implications of this paradigm shift. And I think it would be good to have another session where we now begin to start looking at the practical ways that we start imagining the church responding to what we've heard today. And that would be my suggestion that we look at in, in about a month's time, we look at another, another engagement and that engagement then would need uh, to be more interactive, quite specifically more interactive and people I think should need to prepare um, so what do you imagine, for instance, in Tokai? Sure. Um, what, what do you think should come out of this discussion today? Yep. Okay. Well, Paul, um, uh, through you, um, Stekau, um, I, I agree with Paul, um, probably taking that further that um, as we uh, reflect on this, maybe what we need to do um, is that when we meet now, we need to be saying, you know, we had this presentation and um, how have we uh, tried to implement, if you like, prior to this meeting so that um, we are doing something. It was not something that we are listening to, but also challenging people, you know, where we are. And so that when we, we meet and after reflecting on this and say, this is what we have done uh, as a concrete evidence that we are moving from where we were to somewhere. Okay, thank you, sir. I think also there could be space, if we agree, um, to also take the conversation to, uh, as an important agenda item to our central committee. And um, in the, in, in the five trajectories offering maybe some practical response um, to what we have heard when we sit in the central committee. If I can just say, Sko, I agree with that, but it's a long way away. Yeah, no, no, yes. And, and, and the fire is burning. 
Yes. Um, you know, I'm going back into Phoenix again uh, this on Friday. Uh -huh. um, and um, fortunately, this time we will have, uh, I mean, it's hard to speak like this, but let me say, so last week we had meetings with some of the black youth in Phoenix at the Gandhi Center. And this week we're going to be meeting with them again, particularly people who've been badly affected by the violence. Um, but we'll also be going to the Indian community in the afternoon and wanting to look at how we begin to start engaging a future for those two communities that live right on top of one another. Um, and the, the geography of the place describes exactly the problems that we have been speaking about today. And unless some of the solutions are owned by the community and they can see their influence in dreaming of what must be done there, it will not be sustainable. And uh, it's this kind of talking to one another as the church community that could be very helpful in giving ideas about where we go. What questions do we ask even? Yeah, I agree. I was just saying over and above um, um, the month's engagement, engagement in a month's time, over and above all of that, so that at least we continually um, table um, this as an important agenda. Okay. Thank you. Unless there's any other question or any other comment, then we can draw to the close. Lulu, thank you very, very much for availing yourself. And thank you very much for um, engaging us and challenging our thinking as well and painting uh, this picture. Um, you left us with a lot to chew on. And yes, indeed, um, we hope that we could be part of the solution as well. Um, so thank you, thank you, and all the best to you and, and your job. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be part of this conversation this morning. Um, I will be sending you the slides and happy to engage further and have further discussions. Um, thank, thank you so much. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and so we, we may call on you again. So I'll ask, you uh, Bishop, well. I'll ask Bishop Charles May if maybe he can conclude for us. Thank you. Is that a conclusion in prayer or? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, you have done the vote of thanks and thank you once again as a cow uh, for facilitating this. It really has been very good and we really thank you for that gift that, that you have. Um, and thanks to everyone. Uh, let us pray. Lord God, as we look to you, for wisdom and direction in the challenges that we are faced with. We thank you that you have put us in this situation as members of your body to be present, not just physically, but to make a difference. As we are faced with this injustice, inequality, the lack of jobs, challenges in economy, the challenge of all the things that we are able to share 
but some of us are hoarding. We pray for the spirit of sharing and generosity. Bless us as we seek to do your will. And always know that you give us strength and wisdom to do all that you call us to do. Bless each one of us. Bless churches here in South Africa that are seek to be part of that kingdom building, that we do that with love and grace. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And thank you to all for connecting. And yes, indeed, all material and everything will be sent back to the entire Central Committee. Thank you. Until we meet again. Thank you, Sekou. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.